Yes, uh, Cesar, you can take the floor already. Uh, um, okay, again, an, uh, an, an, a keynote speaker that does not need any introduction. Um, this guy has also moved around uh, in the sense that uh, he also, and this is very good for Europe, right? After uh, Mercedes uh, moving to Copenhagen, we have Cesar moving to Europe. Uh, he's now uh, uh, um, uh, just taken up a chair in, uh, the, at the University of Toulouse. And now I must uh, uh, look carefully what kind of institute it is. The Artificial and Natural Intelligence Toulouse Institute. So he just took up the position there, but he also uh, got a, a new honorary professorship at the University of Manchester. And uh, he's a visiting a professor at Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Um, of course, before coming uh, uh, to Toulouse, uh, uh, he has been uh, head of uh, uh, MIT Media Lab uh, uh, for a long time at the uh, Collective Learning Group. We know him very well, of course, uh, from the literature. Uh, notions as product space and economic complexity, of course, are uh, concepts that are widely used and highly cited. Uh, <coughs> so uh, uh, it's really a great pleasure to have him here. Um, of course, uh, uh, a number of books uh, that have been very influential. Uh, uh, of course, The Atlas of Economic Complexity, uh, the book that he published in 2015, Why Economic Growth. And there's a forthcoming book. <laughs> and I think uh, it's maybe already out or no, no, about no, no, to be yet. out. About to be out. Uh, and that is a in very intriguing uh, uh, topic, how human judge machines. So, uh, and... and I've seen already presentations of that book, and it's really inspiring. So, Cesar, uh, no time to lose. Uh, please <laughs> give the floor to you. Good yeah. luck. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. So today I, I decided to do something a little bit different. Instead of you know, plugging some of my previous research, I decided to innovate and present something that I'm actually working on right now. So this is work in progress. And what this work is trying to do is to try to really go a little bit deeper into you know, measures of economic complexity and try to understand you know, if there are many of them or if actually you know, all of that variation comes from like a few forms and where those forms can tell us something about you know, how uh, we should aggregate you know, knowledge or complexity when we look at data. So the idea of economic complexity has become popular over the last uh, decade, you know, in part because you know, this is a measure that you can use to measure the capacity of allocation or how difficult it is to produce an activity that has a lot of interesting properties. On the one hand, it helps predict future economic growth. It is also a measure that helps explain variations in income inequality. And recently, you know, we have also shown that economic activities that are more complex tend to concentrate more in space than less complex economic activities. So, for example, we knew that innovation tended to be more concentrated, but if we look at innovation in patents in areas that are even more complex, that spatial concentration is even larger. So this is an interesting measure because it predicts a lot of things that we care about. It predicts growth, it predicts inequality, it predicts the spatial concentration of activities and so forth. You know, and it originated about 11 years ago in this PNAS paper. And what we did there was to introduce a measure in which you know, we look at uh, the complexity of locations, we look at the complexity of activities, and we introduce an iterative formula that tells that the complexity of a location is a function of the complexity of the activities that are present in it, and that the complexity of an activity is a function of the locations where that activity is present. You know, but since then, there have been many measures that have been introduced. You know, variations of these metrics, measures that use you know, Bayesian methods, you know, measures that you know, uh, try to combine this with the idea of the triple helix and, and, and you know, nest you know, these iterative mappings in multiple forms. These measures have also have been used in multiple settings. They have used you know, in patent data. They have been used you know, on regional economic data. They have been used in places like China and the UK and the United States. You know? And the thing is, you know, that these different measures have a lot of things in common that make us believe that maybe, you know, they're not, you know, variations of, uh, uh, or, or different flavors, but actually, you know, um, different instantiations on something that is, that is deeper and that actually unites all of them. So first, you know, many of these measures use output data, okay? So these are measures that are based on, you know, the patterns of... Uh, it, 
geographic location of economic activities. So, you know, the products that a country exports, the patents that are produced by a city or by a university, you know, it's a measure of the output that is generated by a unit of geography rather than inputs. So these are not measures that are using, you know, what classes or what patents did a patent cite, but, you know, where, you know, were those patents in that technology produced, you know? And this is something that all of these measures have in common. You know, so they use output data. They use output data that is about locations and activity. So basically what we're trying to do is, if we know the geography, you know, of that activity, can we use that geography of that activity to infer, you know, the complexity of that location or the complexity of that activity? And then different measures give very similar results. So for example, Harman et al., you know, in the World Development Paper on Income Inequality shows, you know, a correlation between ECI and fitness of 86%. Uh, Gao et al., you know, uh, look at data from provinces in China, they find a correlation of 76%. Stojkovsky, you know, combines service and, exp uh, service and export data to create, you know, measures of economic complexity and also, you know, funds that are equally predictive when it comes to future economic growth. Fritz and Manduka do the same for the United States. They use employment data, they find a 90% correlation. So, basically, this starts telling, if there's so many things in common, maybe there's something actually deeper you know, from where all of this can be derived. So let's define complexity, okay? So um, this is my working definition of complexity right now, you know? And it's, it's quite simple and it's quite flexible, but I think there's something profound here, you know? So what we're gonna say is that the complexity of a location, you know, let's call complexity K sub C, you know, is a function F, whatever that F is gonna be, we're gonna explore that later, of the complexity K sub P, of the activities that are present in that location, okay? So if I know who makes what, I'm gonna say that the complexity K of that location is, you know, a function of the complexity of the activities that are present in that location. Okay? Well, the complexity of an activity, you know, K sub P, is gonna be a function of the locations where that activity is present. So I can transform that into a set of coupled equations, you know, this is a mapping in which K sub C, the complexity of the city or country C, is equal to a function of where, you know, uh, an activity is present and what activities are present on that location. So MCP tells me that activity P is present in location C. K sub P, you know, which is the complexity of an activity P, is equal to a function G of where that activity is present and what are the complexity of those activities. So I can put the second equation in the first one or the first one in the second, you know, and what I'm going to obtain is a self-consistent equation in which K sub C is going to be, someone got a WhatsApp message. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so K sub C is going to be a function of K sub C and K sub P is going to be a function of K sub P in that self-consistent equation. So I have a very general way of like solving this. Okay? I have a way to kind of like write generative equations. Another WhatsApp message. Is it me that is getting WhatsApp? It might be me. So I'm going to close my WhatsApp. You know? Yeah. There. Okay. Perfect. You know? Uh, okay. So in a variety of settings, I can reduce the two equations that I have above into linear systems of the following form. You know? I can reduce the equation that I have uh, above into a linear system in which K sub C, which is a vector, which is my unknown, I'm solving for. My unknown is the complexity or the knowledge of a location. It's going to be equal to a matrix MCC prime, you know, of, you know, the same vector. Or I can get that K sub P, which are the complexity of the activities, is going to be equal to a matrix MPP prime, you know, times, you know, K sub P, which is a vector of the complexity of those activities. These equations imply a few things. You know, when you look at the uh, linear equations, like the two matrix equations that we have below, first they tell us that these metrics of complexity are by definition, you know, uh, eigenvectors or measures of centrality or clustering of the networks that connect related activities or related products. So a measure of complexity of activities is by definition you know, a measure of centrality in the network of related products or product space, or the network of related activities or an industry space, okay? So there's an intimate connection with the idea of relatedness and the idea of complexity. Because the matrices that we use to estimate relatedness, okay, are these MCC primes, these MPP primes, you know, are actually the ones that then we calculate the eigenvectors for, you know, uh, that we need to calculate the measures of complexity, okay? So this complexity and relatedness are two kind of like sides of the same coin, you know? Uh, then they also tell us that, you know, these measures of complexity are relative, 
No? Because they have these matrix forms, the complexity of a location can change if nothing in that location changes, but things in other locations change. Okay? So because they're like this you know, uh, eigenvector type of equations, it turns out that it's a relative measure. So it's not something that you have a complexity of something and that's kind of like a number that is interpretable. It's all interpretable in the context of knowing the complexity of the other places. Okay? So these are relative measures. And the third thing that this tells you is that, well, this thing, you know, even though it might be new in this community, it's not that new because you know, equations that we have there, you know, the linear equations, these are classical dimensionality reduction you know, uh, metrics, you know, like principal component analysis. So what the heck is principal component analysis? Let's do a little bit of a refresher on that. Okay? So a principal component is a vector that explains a large amount of variance in a data set. You know, in our case, the presence of an activity in a location. So here we have matrices you know, with the exports of uh, products by countries, patents you know, by in United States MSAs, you know, payroll by industry in the United States. You know? And if we look at these matrices, and there you know, next to them we have the principal component vector for each one of them, you know, what you have is a vector that tries to explain the maximum variance in observations for each one of the subjects, okay? So in, if you are focusing on locations, you know, your subjects are locations, the observations are the activities that are present in them, and you say, I want a vector that helps me explain the best possible the activities that are present in that location. And the first vector is the principal component, number one, the second vector is the principal component, number two, and so forth. But when you look at these vectors, you see something that basically these vectors, you know, when these matrices, of course, are sorted and organized, are very top-heavy, okay? Like, you have, like, large values at the top of the vector, low values at the bottom of the vector, and they're sorted almost equally as if I just sort the matrix by putting the countries that export more things or the cities that patent in more different categories, you know, on the top, and the ones that do less at the bottom. You know? So, to continue with this refresher of principal component, it's like, well, how do you actually get to estimate these principal components? And the algorithm to estimate principal components is the following. You have a matrix like that, and then what you do is you, you know, normalize that matrix. You're trying to make these units a little bit comparable, and then you square it by multiplying it by itself to produce a square matrix. Because you cannot take an eigenvector of a matrix that is not square. Yeah? So you multiply it by itself to get a square vector, and then you calculate the eigenvectors of that square matrix. Okay? But the problem, you know, uh, with the data that we use uh, in economic geography is that actually when we're doing a procedure to simply calculate principal components, we're going to have the problem that the units of measures that we have are not directly comparable. So if we look at the principal component techniques, you know, like they're usually used, for example, on survey data. And on survey data, each subject is a person. The person answers many questions on a survey. So the subjects are comparable. But when we look at economic geography data, well, one row is China and another row is Uruguay. And Uruguay fits like three times on Beijing alone. Okay? So the units are not comparable. Some units are huge, some units are small. The fact that they're called countries, you know, is some sort of historical accident of our politics more than, you know, something that is you know, like a physical constraint or a, or a natural constraint. You know, they come in very different shapes and sizes. The same is true for the products or the industries, you know. Some products like oil, you know, have uh, trade amounts that sometimes they reach, you know, values of about a trillion dollars a year. And there are other products, you know, like dried apples, you know, that uh, amount to less than a billion dollars in export. So these units are not comparable, you know. So if we're trying to estimate, you know, the complexity or the principal components of this matrix, we have the problem of, you know, the non-comparability of these units. And that's basically what these measures of complexity try to resolve, is they try to find principal components, but doing so in such a way that they're able to account for this heterogeneity so they can extract the signal out of the noise, you know, that you're going to always have in this data. Okay? So how should we normalize these matrices? Then, you know, that's kind of like the question that we're at now. So, well, you know, we have these matrices of countries and products, of cities and technologies, of cities and, and, and industries, you know, and there are different ways in which we can try to normalize these matrices. So one would be to do, a, you know, a calculations that would be extensive. What does extensive mean? Extensive is a popular concept uh, from uh, statistical physics, and an extensive variable is a variable that grows as you grow the integration domain of that variable. So, for example, we're in this room, 
you know? And this room has a certain physical property that's called volume. And if I were to put another room of the same size next to this and open the barrier between them, then I would double the volume because volume is an extensive variable. So basically, it's a variable that if I integrate over a larger domain, I add you know, as I integrate. But if I do the same example with this room and I put a room next to it, you know, and these rooms are at different temperature, you know, and I open the barrier, I don't add the temperatures. I average them out. Okay? So there are variables that are intensive you know, because basically when you put multiple units together, you know, you are not adding their amounts, but you're averaging them out. So, like, if we will look at products, let's say, and we're calculating the complexity of a place by looking at the complexity of the activities present in it, if we use an extensive assumption, we say, well, this place makes shirts, makes pants, makes coats, makes coffee, makes heavy machinery, I would kind of, like, add all of that, you know? And you can see the issue with that is that you're going to have a lot of double counting, okay? You know, because doing shirts and doing pants might not be that different. So you might be counting, you know, the complexity of those activities twice, you know, or three times, you know, because it's very redundant. If you do an intensive, you know, uh, assumption, then basically you would grab all of them and you would average them out. Yeah. So if we would look at this from a more, you know, pictographic perspective, if these are the complexities of the activities, if I would use an extensive assumption, I would be adding them out. And if I would use an intensive assumption, basically I would be putting all of them together and I would say, what is the average? So on the top, when I use an extensive assumption, every time a new activity comes to a place, that complexity should increase, you know, because that place now produces more of something, you know, so it's going to get added. But in the second assumption, in intensive assumption, that complexity only increases if what came in is above average, okay? So it's sampling sort of like the tail of the distribution. The problem is that, you know, we can do this in these formula forms, but we can expand, you know, these formulas quite a bit, and we're going to see that in a second. So the extensive assumption, basically what I would say is the complexity K of a CTC is equal to the sum of the complexities of the activities that are present in that city. MCP is just a matrix that tells me, is that activity present there or not? The complexity K of activity P is the sum of the places where that activity is present. So the matrix that I need to diagonalize is simply a matrix that tells me, hey, how many activities do these two places have in common? Okay? Now, if I use an intensive, intensive assumption, then you know, I'm saying, well, the complexity of a place is the average of its activities. The complexity of an activity is the average of the places where it's present. And I get that other matrix that I need to diagonalize. The intensive, intensive assumption is the economic complexity index. Okay? And what we're doing here is actually putting these measures in sort of like a family of mathematical formulas so that we can understand better where they live and how they behave. So how about hybrid alternatives? Because I have the intensive, intensive assumption, which is the economic complexity index. I could have like an extensive, extensive assumption, which is similar to normal PCA, but I could have hybrids. I could have a measure that is extensive for countries and intensive for activities, or vice versa. Or I can have measures that have reciprocals that sometimes, well, I'm not adding the complexity of the activities, I'm adding one over the complexity of the activities, so I'm adding reciprocals and taking you know, uh, different types of averages and so forth. So what we can do to explore this space of functions is that we have you know, this general idea on the top that the complexity of allocation is a function of the activities that are present in it, and the complexity of an activity is a function of the places where that activity is present and their complexities, and we can generalize it by using the following parametrization. So we grab this formula and we put some coefficients alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, and theta that are going to take very few values. One minus one in the case of alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, and one zero minus one for epsilon and theta. So what am I doing with this? Well, with epsilon, which is this coefficient here, you know, I can, whoa, whoa. The stage finishes, yeah? <laughs> So for epsilon, what I can do is when I do epsilon equals zero, I turn that formula off. Okay? I turn, you know, MC, you know, I turn kind of like the number of activities present allocation off. If I do it equal to one, I've taken the average. If I'm doing minus one, I'm putting it on the top. Yeah? You know? With gamma, well, if I got gamma equals to one, the sum is on the top. If I got gamma equals to one, I bring the sum down. With alpha, if I have alpha equals to 1, 
I'm summing the complexity of the activities. Either doing minus one, I'm summing the reciprocals, and so forth. So I have a way to explore this space of functions. Okay? And this is the space of functions that we have. Okay? So you know, we can organize the space of functions. We have ECI there as the number one function, intensive-intensive. We have the intensive extensive assumption, extensive intensive, you know? and number 50 is the fitness formula. You know? And we have actually two pages of functions. We have 144 you know, possible combinations that we're going to explore. And this seems daunting because 144 formulas is a lot of formulas. But as we're going to see, actually, you know, they belong to very well-defined classes that have you know, shared properties. So our object of a study is this family of functions, you know, the family of possible ways to measure complexity. You know? uh, we are going to apply this you know, to data on countries and products, cities and technologies, cities and industries. And what I would do is I'm going to show that this space is densely filled with metrics of complexity that behave similarly to those published in the literature. So complexity is not kind of like a secret sauce that has like this formula. It's actually a very general idea for which many solutions are available. You know? And I'll compare this matrix to then ask, well, at the end of the day, if we look at these different functions and we see how they behave, is knowledge or complexity something that behaves more as an intensive or as an extensive variable? Is something that I should be adding as I add any activity, or is something that truly is coming from averages? Okay? So that's going to give us some little bit of a deeper insight into the nature you know, of the geography of knowledge. So let's bring in the data, finally. Okay. So here we have international trade data. And what you see here are basically two versions of the same matrix. Here on the right, you have a matrix in which we've calculated these 144 formulas with this data, and we've calculated the correlation between each pair you know, of formulas. Okay, so we have 144 by 144 matrix, and we look at the R square because we don't care if the correlation is plus one or minus one. Okay, they're collinear in both cases. So we look at the square. But here on the left, what we're looking is that the first, you know, like entries, the intensive, 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 extensive, extensive, intensive, extensive, extensive, and formula number 50, which is fitness. And what we find is, for example, that the intensive, intensive, and the intensive, ex extensive, they're quite collinear, you know? So they're kind of like two ways of calculating the same. But we also find, like this other cluster here, that the extensive, intensive, which is a linear formula, behaves the same as the fitness formula, which is a nonlinear formula. So you don't need nonlinearity to get that result. Okay? You can get it perfectly using a linear formula. You get a correlation of 0 0.99, which you know, is basically almost perfect correlation you know, between these formulas. Now, let's bring in technology data. So this is data on US MSAs and technologies. This is patent data. Basically, we find a very similar story. You know? We find kind of like that intensive-intensive and intensive-extensive you know, behave kind of like similar. They have a correlation there of 0.83. You know? Like on the sign, you can always flip it because eigenvectors, you can multiply them by minus 1 on both sides of the equation, and you know, it's the same. And you also find a lot of collinearity between you know, fitness, which is extensive-extensive, reciprocal-reciprocal, and the two extensive forms, the extensive-extensive and the extensive-intensive. Now, you look at payroll data. And you get also something similar. You know, it's a little bit more fuzzy. But at the end of the day, when we look at international trade data, technology data, industries, payroll data, we find that these matrices behave very similarly. They, like, if there would be a carpet, there would be a carpet with the same design. OK? So you know, this tells us that there's something kind of in common going on here, that all of these formulas are not many different formulas. that are actually you know, few instantiations of a more general mathematical object. So let's like, try to explore that. So one thing that we can do is, well, we have these matrices, but even though they have a lot of structure, you know, it's hard to see the structure when we order them this way. So what we can do is cluster them. So we apply hierarchical or clustering type of algorithm. We say, OK, there are not a lot of groups. There are few groups. You know? There are kind of like three groups, more or less, you know, depending on, on, on how you look at the data and, and, and how willing are you you trade the green with the yellow. You know? But they seem you know, quite regular. The problem of these hierarchical clustering methods, though, is that you, know, you apply different type of hierarchical clustering algorithms and you get slightly different things. You, know, you use average link and clustering or minimum clustering and so forth. So maybe we want a more principled way to cluster this. Can we find the mathematical patterns that will help us define you know, these clusters in a more principled way? 
So let's try to identify these clusters. So here we have a matrix on the right, you know, with the correlation between all of the metrics. And on the left, you know, you have how this matrix was constructed. Okay? So we have these six parameters, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, and theta, you know, and these are, you know, produced in nested for loops. So the parameter alpha, which is the one that says if you're adding the complexity of the activities of the reciprocal, goes between 1 and minus 1, you know, so the first half is with alpha equals 1, the second half is with alpha equals minus 1. The parameter beta, you know, is inside that for loop, so it goes 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1. The parameter gamma, delta, epsilon, and theta, and so forth, are being iterated internally. So this is sort of like how you would visualize the value of the parameters in these nested for loops as they're cycling through that. And you see that there's kind of like some sort of, you know, artistic correspondence between them, okay? But we're going to go a little bit deeper. So we're going to grab a row now, you know, like the fourth row, which is the extensive intensive variable. We're going to bring it there. I'm going to say, okay, where is the yellow? Is there like a pattern to where the yellow is? Okay? And we say, well, the yellow on the vector doesn't tend to coincide with the yellow on the epsilon variable. So maybe, you know, one thing that we're finding here is that all of these formulas, what they have in common is epsilon equals zero. And maybe they don't care about that much more than epsilon being equal to zero. And other than that, you have a lot of freedom. So we put epsilon equals zero there. We look at the formula and we say, like, mm, OK, epsilon equals zero kind of works. But there's, there's a lot of yellow that is still not explained by epsilon equals zero. So maybe we need to do this with a little bit more nuance. So we're going to now grab one of those vectors and we're going to fold it by nine. What do I mean by that? We're going to grab that vector, we're going to rotate it, we're going to stretch it, and basically we're going to create a matrix you know, that is of 9 by 16 that is going to take that vector and it's going to factorize it. You know? And this 9 makes sense you know, because remember that epsilon and theta, like the denominators, go 1, 0, and minus 1. So they have three options and there's two of them, so there's nine options. Okay? So like what we're doing here is grabbing this vector, the first three, you know, a rows become, you know, the first three entries that are on the column and so forth. And here you see that there's a clear pattern. Yeah? There's a clear pattern. What is this pattern? Well, if we put the formulas on top, we're going to see there is this huge band in the center with epsilon equal to zero. You know? But there's a little bit more. You know? There is one set of solutions that is epsilon equal to zero. There's another set of solutions that is equivalent to these ones, which is epsilon equal minus one, gamma equals to one. That's with trade data. Now let's bring in pattern data. And when we bring pattern data, we find kind of like almost the same, but there are some solutions out there that are starting to fizzle out. They don't look that good, you know? So maybe, you know, this doesn't work that well. And when I go to the industry data, actually a lot of those solutions fizzle out, and I get that these solutions, you know, the ones in the red squares and the one in purple are the ones that work, you know, across all data sets, and they define a group of equivalent metrics. Okay? It's epsilon equals theta, uh, theta uh, sorry, epsilon equals zero and theta times delta equals to one. I can do the same with ECI. Okay? So I grab ECI, I bring it there, I say, mm, okay, so this guy doesn't like epsilon equals zero. What does it like? It appears to like when epsilon is equal to gamma and theta equals to theta. What that does mean is that basically it's an intensive formula, but it doesn't care if, you know, it's the sum of the complexities of an activity divided by the number of activities present in a place or the reciprocal of that. As long as, you know, one is in the top and the other one is in the bottom, it's okay. If you're adding complexities, you're adding the reciprocal of complexities, it doesn't care. It doesn't care about alpha and beta. Okay? So we look at that, we see that epsilon equal gamma, theta equal theta, it hits the yellows perfectly, but there's more to it. So we're going to explore this again. We're going to factorize by nine. This is where these solutions land. In trade data, we see that there's some other solutions there that behave very similar you know, to this epsilon equal gamma and data, uh, delta equal theta solution. But when we bring in the patent data and then the industry data, you know, the solutions that really stand out and work the best is this epsilon equal gamma and delta equal theta solution. With fitness, we can do the same. We also find a family of solutions you know, that are equivalent and satisfy the following rule. So we had clustered those formulas first using average link and clustering. And on the right, there you would see you know, the set of parameters that belongs to each one of those rows. But now we have a set of learned rules that give us a very clear set of patterns you know, and that we can use to cluster this matrix again.
you know? And we're going to be clustering not the whole matrix, but a subset of it, the subset of it that has solutions that appear to work. And how would this look like? Well, if you look at it, you know, it looks like magic. It's like almost beautiful, perfect clustering. Yeah? You know? So, you know, you very well define, you know, groups that you can observe there, you know, that satisfy, you know, this idea that the formulas are more or less the same. It works for exports, it works for patents, it works for industries. The fact that you see a little bit of variation across them, it tells you that these formulas are not functionally equivalent. They're not exactly the same mathematically, but they give, you know, nevertheless, uh, a result that empirically is very, 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 very similar. Okay? So they're not exactly functionally equivalent because it varies a little bit among them. But, you know, the clusters are the same among them. What are these clusters? Okay? So you have the family of extensive metrics there on the top, like the big red square on the upper left. Then on the bottom right here, you have the family of the ECIs, of the Economic Complexity Index. All of those metrics, you pick any of them, you're going to calculate you know, a complexity metric, you're going to get the same thing that if you use the ECI. And the little square in the, in the, in the middle there you know, is the fitness metrics. In exports and patent data, they behave like a member of the extensive family. In industry data, half of that cluster behaves as an extensive, and that cluster behaves as intensive. So we have these families with you know, 24 members, 16 members. But let's now look at the data and see you know, how do these metrics behave. Okay? So if I look at international trade data and I compare the intensive-intensive variable, which is ECI, and the extensive-intensive variable, you know, what I find is the following. Is that the extensive-intensive variable here is one that likes size a little bit too much. You know? So it puts you know, like a country like Indonesia on top of a country like Singapore. You know? It puts China ahead of Finland. And the ECI, the intensive-intensive variable you see, like here on the top and on the right, is able to pick up a lot of signals for relatively small countries. So it appears to solve better this problem of the non-comparable units of observation, because here you get Singapore, Ireland, Finland, Sweden, Switzerland, you know, even Norway, you know, comes out better there. There are smaller countries, but they're more knowledge-intense, so we're measuring something that is more knowledge per capita. Now, let's look at technologies, okay? So these are USMSAs based on technologies. If I use the extensive intensive matrix, you know, that metric loves cities that are relatively large, like Chicago and Cleveland and LA and New York. But if I look at the intensive intensive varieties, you know, then I get, well, San Jose, Austin, San Francisco, San Diego, Poughkeepsie, which is where IBM is, you know, uh, Rochester, Minnesota, that's the Mayo Clinic. It's a very big, you know, research center in the United States. So I also am able to pick signals for places that are high in complexity and knowledge intensity, even though they're not big metropolis or megalopolis. When I look at payroll data, you know, like San Jose looks horrible in an extensive metric, but San Jose is on the top when I look at an intensive, intensive metric. So if I look at ECI, San Jose, San Francisco, Boston, you know, are there on the top. Uh, also another small but complex location like Chapel Hill, you know, which is the heart of the research triangle, also comes out and so forth. But if I look at the extensive, intensive metrics, I get, you know, something that is also more biased towards sites. Now if I look at activities, not at locations, I find a similar story. So in extensive, intensive metrics here, I use like the, the fitness metric, you know, which belongs to the same cluster as other metrics. I get castor oil, manila hemp, you know, uh, potassium salts and roasted iron pirates on the top, which is sort of like not what we want, you know. But if I look at the intensive, intensive metric, I get, you know, silicons, factory tracks, data processing equipment. I kind of like have a bias towards things that intuitively would be more intensive in knowledge or more complex. The same is true for patents, you know. With an intensive, intensive metric, I get computer memory, data processing, input and output devices, virtual machines, computer processors. Otherwise, I get crop threshing, wheel substitutes, vehicle fenders, perfume, and whatnot. And when it comes to like the um, activities in the payroll data, they look more or less the same, except that in the extensive metrics, you know, metal ore mining, coal mining, they score much higher, also not what we want. Okay? So this appears to tell us that knowledge appears to be quite intense. Okay, so let's try to wrap up and summarize. So we have been looking at the location of economic activities, and one of the things that I've been trying to do for about a decade is to figure out how we can use information about the location of economic activities to infer you know, what is the complexity of these activities and you know, which are the locations that can produce the most complex activities.
And what we found is that to do that, you know, we need to do a procedure that has a lot of steps, many of which involve normalization. So we grab a data, for instance, of exports, but this is also true for payroll data or the patent data. And this data has a lot of structure, you know, we sort it properly. Uh, but we need to normalize it a couple of times. One normalization is when we calculate RCA or the location quotient. You know, that's something that is trying to help make these units of observation comparable by normalizing by the sum of the row and the sum of the columns. We then denoise again when we transform this matrix into a binary matrix by only considering locations that have comparative advantage in an activity or not. And eliminating RCA can have values of the order of 10 to the 3, which are very large. You know? so, so we reduce a lot of that variance by making this a binary matrix. But then we find that we need to normalize again. And depending on how we normalize, when we're going to square that matrix to calculate the PCAs, you know, we're going to get you know, outcomes that are going to be able to extract the signal from the noise or not. So here we have the matrix, and you know, it's normalized square. You know? And this is sort of like what you would get if you would just count the number of products that a country exports. The same you would find if you do industries, locations, cities, and so forth. And here you have the different metrics. And when you look at, for example, this intensive-intensive variable like the ECI, you see that you're able to highlight you know, and extract the signal. And this looks like a bit like a physical spectrum when you look at like, you know, light crossing you know, a, a diffraction grade. You see Singapore, you see Ireland, you see Finland, you see Israel, you see Sweden, you see Japan popping out, you know, which they would be otherwise, you know, hidden if you would have done a simple PCA type measure that would be too biased towards the size of locations, you know. When you do something like fitness and when you do something that is like extensive intensive, you do get to see a little bit of that signal. You see that some of those lines kind of like match, but not as much. They don't extract that information with the same amount of power. So actually, this, you know, multiple levels of normalization is what allows you to make the units comparable and to extract that information. The same is true for technologies. You know, here, you know, we can get San Jose, Austin, Chapel Hill to come up. In the other metrics, you know, basically New York, Chicago, Philly, like these large cities, you know, are coming up. So this is telling you, well, you know, there's something beyond size that is being captured by this metric of complexity. And, you know, it can be done only if you start thinking of complexity as an intensive variable, not something that is intensive. Okay? So to conclude, during the last decade, you know, Measures of complexity have become popular because they can predict future economic growth, they explain variation in income inequality, and they explain the spatial concentration of economic activities. But what I'm trying to argue here is that complexity is not a secret sauce. It's not kind of like a formula that there's one way of calculating and it kind of works. It's, it's something that is quite general. It's a formula related to the idea of principal component analysis, but that has corrections that account for an inherent problem that we have when we work with economic data you know, and data on geography, which is that the units of analysis are not directly comparable. Some are huge, some are tiny, you know, and you need to be able to account for that. And you do that by filtering, but also by normalizing the data iteratively so that you can extract you know, the signal from the noise. You know? And by exploring these normalizations, we learn something important. There's a lot of possible ways of calculating them, but they belong to a few classes. You know? And when we look at these classes, we find that actually intensive metrics tend to behave better. So you know, many years ago, we learned that knowledge was an unrivaled type of you know, a variable. Now we're learning that maybe it's an intensive type of variable. It's kind of like something you know, that is per capita and that only grows you know, as you, know, you develop above average activities in a location. It's not something that you can simply add by throwing anything into a place. You know? And also, complexity is something that is very different from other indexes that basically are calculated you know, uh, using certain normative parameters, and then they're published and they're set up sto in stone. So you know, the HDI is whatever the HDR of office you know, calculates. This is something that we can calculate dynamically from any data. We can vary parameters and produce you know, a new version right away. So that's a little bit of what we're doing. So we have a new version of the Observatory of Economic Complexity coming out in a few weeks. You know, it includes uh, a lot more data than, than before. You know, not only data at the national level or with monthly resolution, but it includes also data on patents, includes data at the subnational level. You know, uh, and what we're going to do there is we're going to move away from publishing complexity indicators 
as like a fixed table that people can use, but something that is interactive. That you can say, hey, I want to calculate complexity. I want to include countries only that export over a billion, you know, and I want to include, you know, a average over three-year time windows, and boom, and you get your estimate so that we can actually transform this into a dynamic estimate. And with that, I'm going to finish my presentation. I have like only a few small you know, announcements to make. One is that I have a book coming out uh, uh, this spring. It's called How Human Judge Machines. We do more than 100 experiments in which we compare how people react to mistakes made by machines with the same mistakes made by humans. And we learn a lot about when we have biases in favor or against machines. It's going to come out with MIT Press. So uh, take a look for that. The second announcement is that, as some of you know, I'm moving to Toulouse uh, this summer. You know. Uh, and I'm hiring postdocs, so if you're interested, you know, on these lines of research or, or you would like to inquire about that, there are going to be calls, you know, for postdocs uh, to join us in Toulouse to work on these topics, but also on topics of applied uh, artificial intelligence. And with that, I would like to thank you for your time. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, um, I'm afraid that we have only time for one short question. Okay. Make it count. <laughs> All right. Well, that's good for the timing then. Okay. Okay, Ron, you don't have... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. All right, thanks very much. Yeah, thank uh, you. Cesar, and, uh, yes, because